swords. Who doesn't love a good sword? Communists, probably. And video games are full of swords. A lot of them, and I mean a lot of them. There are games that have so many swords in them that you kind of wonder, wow, when will I have time to use all of them? On whom shall I use all of them? Well, that's a question that we're not gonna answer in this show, instead we're gonna see what are the top 7 best swords in video games. The absolute best, greatest, most amazing, most super duper awesome swords ever put into a video game. With the mention that they have to be swords. So as much as I like the dagger of time, it's a dagger. It's still a bladed weapon, but it's a dagger, it's not a sword. There's a bit of a difference there. It doesn't behave like one, it's not wielded like one, it's not used like one. So sadly, no dagger of time in this show. That being said, let's get it started with number 7, the Masamune. Sephiroth's best Big ass, gigantic, oversized sword. Even though you never get to actually use it in Final Fantasy VII, just look at it. It's gigantic and with each successive iteration of the character of the sword, it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, it may, it may be something Freudian in there about the uh, popularity of the game and the sword size or... I don't know. I, I'm not gonna get into it, but god damn was that sword cool as hell, wasn't it? When you played the game for the first time and saw that big ass gigantic sword, you just went, man, that's a sword. Everything else looks so goddamn puny by comparison. I kind of feel emasculated right now and turned on. And also I have this gravelly voice for some reason. I don't know, the sword just does it to people. Doesn't matter who you are. I'm gonna stop doing the voice now because it's hurting my throat. A fantastic imposing design that just screams that the person wielding it is a badass motherfucker. How Sephiroth got it I'll never know. Well actually I can probably know because I think they made like five or six games explaining the origins of swords or at least five books or comics. There's uh, there's a lot of content of Final Fantasy 7 outside the game itself. And if you're gonna say, well, why not the Buster Sword? It's more iconic. Yeah, Buster Sword looks nice, but in an actual fight, you kind of have to face it. The Masamune has reach. Number six, Griswold's Edge, forged by a legendary blacksmith of Tristram upon the Anvil of Fury. An anvil that once stood at the heart of the Hellforge itself. An anvil imbued with the power of hell and all its demonic energy, used now by one mortal, one master craftsman to create a weapon that will kill the devil, or Diablo at least. Even the act of forging it causes the earth to shake as the power of the anvil is absorbed by the sword and when crafting a sword starts causing earthquakes, you just know you're in for something amazing and in Diablo 1 this sword was amazing. Oh sure it did drop your life by a bit but it could just kick complete ass on normal difficulty at least. You were surrounded by a dozen hell knights no problem. This sword would just launch them back like they were punched by Bud Spencer. It would make a group fight a one-on-one -on -one within seconds. Now sure, if you're fighting archers, you'd uh, constantly have to go after them again. But that is a small price to pay for a sword this cool. And it was also available in Diablo 2, again with knockback, which when used by a paladin with zeal was kind of a horrible trait to have, especially since it was part of a paladin only set. And it then showed up in Diablo 3 as well in like two or three different forms with numbers ranging in the bajillions because Blizzard likes numbers so big that they become meaningless. Which I can understand with the amount of money they've made from World of Warcraft. Number 5. Karsomir, guarded by the fable red dragon Fjerkrag himself. This sword of legend, this holy avenger, this weapon created to smite evil in the face or in the gut or whatever is possible to smite evil in is, without a doubt, the most powerful sword in Faerun. Or at least in Baldur's Gate, I don't really care. It's an amazing sword. A plus five holy avenger. Do you even understand how much plus five is in classic-ish 2.0 D&D? It is a lot. It is a heck of a lot. It is a gigantic amount of to hit accuracy and bonus damage. And it can also dispel pretty much anything it touches. 
It's as if it was crafted to fight an evil sorcerer, which guess what, that's why you're fighting in uh, Baldur's Gate 2. And because it is a sword created to fight evil, to smite evil, to crush evil under its foot, it can only be wielded by the pure soul of a paladin, a noble paladin, or because Baldur's Gate 2 didn't get the rules right, also by a bard, because a bard can use any item. Even if it's something of divine origin that should have only been wielded by a paladin. Now initially I didn't mind because I played a bard the first time, but it doesn't make sense. You should not be able to use a holy divine artifact like this. It doesn't matter how drunk you are. Which is why a modder did not work that way. So the world would make sense again. And in the expansion, Karsomir becomes a plus six sword by socketing the Eye of Tear in its pummel. For those who don't know, plus six is, oh dear god, you're gonna go kill god, aren't you? Level of uh, enchantment. It harkens back to an age where numbers meant something. A simpler age, a more civilized age. Speaking of which, number four, the lightsaber. It's a sword, you know, it's a laser, but it's a sword. It behaves like one, it looks like one, it cuts people like one, but really, really well, and it also cuts other things. The lightsaber, in many of its incarnations, not the Force Unleashed, god damn it, the Force Unleashed neutered the lightsaber. You didn't have a lightsaber in that game, you had a glowing baton, a rubber baton. You would bludgeon people to death with it. Bludgeon. With a lightsaber. Not everybody had Kartosis armor. Wookiees are not made of Kartosis. God damn, I hate what they did to the lightsaber in that game. But you know what it was great? It was amazing, it was superb in the Jedi Knight series. Where it could cut, it could deflect, he could throw it around in arcs and slice people in half. He could do things with it. Amazing things. You could accidentally kill yourself sort of with, oh no, not actually, but if, if the enemy's lightsaber flew from their hand when they died and uh, before it closed, it cut you to bits, you'd die. Because it was a deadly weapon. A weapon made for precise use by force-sensitive, near-future-seeing space wizards. Not some yokel. Some yokel can't use a lightsaber properly. Eventually, they'll slice off something that's not meant to be sliced off and won't grow back. But when you're a Jedi and can see a little bit into the future, you sort of know, okay, I shouldn't do that because I'll slice my head off. Then because you can cut through anything, it's a very versatile tool. You need to open the door, okay, cut through it. Which, you cut, you did sometimes in Jedi Knight, but not all that often. Man, if, if they were to marry the, the dismemberment mechanic, of Jedi Knight and the physics of the Force Unleashed, the DMM powered physics, which you're gonna have to face it, LucasArts ruined by exclusively licensing it for its cancelled games. Combined, they would be amazing. And speaking of combinations, number three, Armageddon's Blade. Forged from the Shield of the Dam, the Sword of Hellfire, and the Breastplate of Brimstone. This relic of a bygone age, the time before the silence when men were gods and wielded the power to reshape worlds, this blade stood among the greats, feared. A sword that can kill a world, Armageddon's blade. Were it to be plunged into the ground by someone wishing the destruction of the world, it would happen. Also clashing it with a sword of frost would do kind of the same thing. An apocalyptic explosion that would just dwarf any sort of nuke that we have on earth. All of them combined would do diddly compared to this. And it's not just a lore thing that it can and has destroyed worlds. But in game, this allows anyone, anyone to cast expert level Armageddon while keeping the units under the wielder's control immune to it. And it also gives some bonuses to attack, defense and spell power. I don't think it does give you as much as the individual artifacts would, but you get expert level Armageddon, which kind of guarantees you're gonna kill everybody no matter what. Apart from black dragons, because they're immune to all spells, unless you get an orb of vulnerability, in which case, well, you they're gonna be kind of not all that immune so you will end up killing everyone it is a sword made to kill everyone and as we've seen in heroes 4 it has it has killed everyone oh my god it's killed so many people it's probably killed some gods too it just kind of makes you wonder 
just really how powerful were the ones that created it. How crazy would it be to go back to a time before the silence fell or to end the silence. Okay, so it kind of did end the silence in Mighty Magic 7, but the fans said, nee, we can wait. And then Ubisoft took over and, oh, we don't know what it is about. It's just, it's just, it's just fan. It's Warcraft now. So much lost potential. Number two, the Soul Reaver. Created as a blood drinking blade, dubbed the, the Blood Reaver, and infused with the soul of a restless, ravenous wraith, a demented spirit bent on consuming every soul the blade touches, even though that of its wielder. This blade is, on the one hand, very powerful and, on the other, capable of breaking time due to the nature of the soul within it. That is the central pillar, get it, of the Legacy of Cain series. A sword that gave Cain the power to break the flow of time, to reverse a fate that seemed at the time horrible, but turned out to be an alternative to an even worse fate. It was then picked up by Raziel and it bonded with him at a spiritual level to the point where the shell of it, the body, the, the blood reaver was no longer needed. Just the spectral blade of the ravenous spirit within. The true essence of the soul reaver. Spoiler, it's actually Raziel. A blade of so much power that it not only destroys the flesh, but it consumes the soul. It nullifies the essence completely. All to satisfy its hunger. All to feed the wheel. Or maybe not the wheel. Maybe the parasite that has laid claim to it. It's an imposing sword and its design and its power and it's been in a lot of games. Not just the Soul Reaver ones or the Blood Omen ones. It's also been in Tomb Raider where you can have Lara Croft wielding the Soul Reaver because hey, she would. You know she would. She'd probably steal it off Kane himself. The old Lara would. The I'm gonna go kill a god Lara. I miss that Lara. And the Soul Reaver too. Because you kind of know we're probably not gonna get a new proper Soul Reaver game where the blade is featured prominently and used to its maximum potential. Now, before I get to number one, I must warn you that this is not for the faint of heart. This is a blade that may frighten people if you have problem with heart disease, I suggest you end the video now. If you're squeamish, it may also have problems. And if you're easily aroused, get some napkins. For this is number one, the Progenator 3000. A blade forged from a bunch of crap collected by that spank himself. With a skull on its hilt, with runes on its chip blade, and then some spikes with more blade, and then there's a mace. There's the spike mace and skulls, two skulls, three skulls, and then some spikes with some rope and a thing that spins. I think that's that's not a turtle. That's some barb. That's a hamster with a wheel. Then that's more spikes. That's a beehive. That's a mouse trap with more runes and it just goes higher. And then more spinning blades. And there's a spider with a uh, pitchfork and some rusted cans. And there's a porcupine. There's a voodoo doll. There's a snappy. There's a. Oh my God! There's so much. Look, there's spot. There's a satellite. That's funny. And at the end, there is the sharp tip, glowing tip, reaching to the heavens with a daisy on it and a pair of scissors and something else. If that's not the best sword in the world, I don't know what is. I mean, look at it. it it's not as big outside of the cinematic, but it's still... For that cinematic alone, it is imposing, it is magnificent, it is gigantic, it is the best sword you will ever find in a video game. Special mentions go out to uh, that, that soul blade edge thing look nice. I guess. Oh yeah, and every weapon in Onimusha, every sword in Onimusha was awesome. Also the Sword of Ayana from uh, Blade of Darkness. It was cool as well. If you have your own suggestions, make sure to mention them in the comments. Goodbye.